Hey everybody, hope you guys are all doing okay. Welcome to the start of a brand new project. As you can see, we are going to be playing Cyrilim Ultimate. And uh, I'm really excited about this. But uh, this is going to be a bit of a special kind of series for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is a very special kind of game. More on that in just a moment, but also the series itself is going to be unorthodox in the sense that I'm not going to be starting exactly at the beginning and all of these things are interrelated. Let's start off with what kind of a game Cyrilim Ultimate is. So if you look at their uh, uh, Steam page, it gives a pretty good uh, description. It's a uh, it's a combination between an action RPG and a kind of creature collection, creature battling game. So their Steam page puts it this way, that it's a uh, monster catching, dungeon crawling RPG with a ridiculous amount of depth. Summon over 1200 different creatures and travel through randomly generated dungeons to acquire resources, new creatures, and loot. If you're looking to compare Cyrilim Ultimate to other games, you might think of it as Pokemon meets Diablo, or more accurately, Dragon Warriors Monsters meets Path of Exile. Now, as soon as I read that description, pretty much my interest was piqued straight away. I've never played uh, Dragon Warrior Monsters, I'll be honest, but I have played Path of Exile, and that game is famously, and perhaps <laughs> notoriously, pretty complicated in terms of just the amount of different things you can do with your build. And that's the kind of thing I enjoy a lot, you know, just coming up with really complicated builds. It's a similar feel to what I was doing in Chronicon, but this game just takes it to a whole other level. There is one other similarity that this game has with Chronicon, which will also explain why I'm doing this series in the way that, that I am, why I won't be starting with a fresh save file, and then going through, uh, you know, from the very start. The reason is because this is one of those games where there is a main story, but the main story isn't very long. The vast bulk of the game comes from being in the end game and seeing how far you can push yourself similar to uh, you know chronicon where you're kind of just pushing higher and higher rifts to see how good my build was a very similar logic to this but you can only do that once you've unlocked all the end game content and that takes a while to do so, the point at which I'm going to start the series, when I'll just load up my save file, is going to be the point at which the final major game mechanic is about to be unlocked. So, we're going to be starting the series, it'll feel we you know when I show you my save file and how much time I've put it, put into it, it might seem like we're very deep into it and that there's not much to do. But trust me, this is one of those games where there is a lot to do. And we, uh, well, I've barely even scratched the surface with all the time that I've put into it. As I mentioned, there's a major game mechanic that I've only just unlocked in the save. So without further ado, let's go to the next screen and uh, before we jump into the game, let's just pause for a moment and look at this screen where uh, we are uh, just looking at, you know, the save slots. I only have one slot in use. Let's just look at these numbers for a moment. Now, Without context, you might interpret these numbers in a bunch of different ways. Perhaps you might look at it and say, oh, 
This game, you've obviously been playing it for 219 minutes. That's about, yeah, three and a half hours, or getting close to four hours. So it, it makes sense that you've, you know, you've beaten the main story and you're into the end game. But then you're like, hang on, so if it's counting minutes and seconds, what's that last number? Is the game counting milliseconds as well? Hmm, that's a bit odd. But then you take another look. You take another look at how these <laughs> numbers are displayed. And then slowly, much to your horror, you come to the creeping realization that no, the first number isn't... <laughs> It isn't counting how many minutes I've been playing this game for. The first number is hours. The second number is minutes, and the third number is obviously seconds. Largely irrelevant, but the first number, once you realize that it's actually almost 220 hours that have been put into the save file, suddenly that puts everything else I've said previously into a whole different light. And you might then wonder, and rightly so, you'd be like, hang on, didn't you just say that you're just barely getting started? Like, you've only just unlocked, you know, the last major mechanic of the game, and you're 220 hours in? And, yeah, I have to say, your astonishment is definitely warranted. It, uh, it's, uh, as I've said, uh, as I said right in the beginning, it's definitely a special kind of game. And at this point, I guess I should mention another, I guess, special attribute to this series in particular, is that I don't expect that this series will ever end. In fact, I don't expect that this game will ever end. I... And I'm not even saying this as a joke. I'm... Like... I mean, I, I hope it isn't true, but it might be true, is that it's possible that I'll spend the rest of my natural life playing this game without ever finishing it. Now, I mean, like, finishing can mean different things to different people. Some people might consider this game finished if, you know, you've beaten the main quest and you're done, but if you've watched anything else on my channel, you know that I like to do things to a 100% uh, level of completion. And if that's the standard that we're applying, then yes, it's quite likely that this game will never be finished. So rather than thinking of it as something to reach the end point of, I will instead be using this series as a way to just... just to have something that's always gonna be there and then we'll slowly make progress and then each bit of progress will be, you know, satisfying to get, but we won't necessarily be thinking about 100%, at least not just yet. Maybe we'll get there, never say never, but if we do, it's gonna take years. Let's just, let's just put it that way. Okay, with that said, it's now time to get into the game itself. And then I'll explain a bit more about how I'm doing this series, I'll talk a bit about my build, and we might even do a quick run. In fact, we're definitely going to do a quick run. I, I mean, I don't think I would bring you <laughs> into this video just to hear me talk and, and to just stare at the menu for, uh, for 10 minutes and then not show you any gameplay. Of course not. That would be, be a very mean thing to do. So let's jump right in. Let me just make sure recording is capturing things properly. Seems like it is. Okay. So here we are in my lovely abode, my castle. So when you start out this game, the castle looks very different. And if you have just started out uh, for yourself and you're looking at my castle and you're wondering why it looks so different, well, partially, well, let's, 
Uh, you know what, I'll... I won't go down, because there's going to be some stuff down that's not really a spoiler, but uh, not something that I want to get into just yet. So, the way this game works is that every part of it, or or many, many parts of it, are customizable to absurd levels. And one of them includes the layout for your own hub area. So, as you can see, I've... Uh, I, hmm. I don't think I've changed the walls, but I have changed the floor tiles, and I have changed the background. You know, that cool red, uh, uh, like these lines being traced, I don't know how to des describe it, but it looks really cool. So I've picked that as my background. I've also moved around a lot of the functional things. So this thing, which is how you basically do runs, initially, it starts out on a room to on the very top of this hub area. I moved it down here just because, you know, it's uh, easier to get to. Around it, I've put some other useful things. So this is the, how you summon monsters. This is uh, the, uh, the Goblet of Trials, which we're going to talk about. I guess we'll talk about it when it fills up, because uh, there's a lot to uh, a lot to digest with this thing. Then there's uh, this uh, person, this uh, person with his device, this dude. It's hard to see, but he's got crazy Einstein kind of uh, hairstyle going on, and he's got his a. Uh, a like chalkboard with some sort of equation on it and his uh, and then his device behind him this is the fusion lab where uh, you can fuse your monsters and make hybrid creatures that are combinations we'll be talking more about fusions later as well because that again opens up a whole avenue of further complications, but also possibilities for uh, build customization. And uh, I've fused most of my monsters, but not all of them. We'll talk about that when I talk about my build, which I'll be doing very shortly as soon as I just mention these last couple of things. This is a... Uh, I guess this is uh, just kind of a credits. You can look at uh, the people who... Okay, I guess these are the uh, the backers, probably, from the crowdfunding. And, uh, you, you know, it's a nice little touch. And the thing that you use to access it looks pretty cool as well. Just a floating giant book. So, uh, I've, I've kept it there. I, I could move it uh, somewhere else, but uh, I, it, it started there, I think, or, or thereabouts. So I figured, you know, let's, let's leave it there. Next to it is this device which can help you manage your resources. If you're running low on one resource, but you've got a glut of some other resource, you can uh, convert them. You can also destroy nether stones and get piety. We'll be talking about nether stones as well because that's a whole other... I keep saying that's a whole other thing when I'm talking about game mechanics, but it really is true. Each individual game mechanic has its own crazy level of depth and complication and it adds up to a uh, very... like it adds up to some crazy crazy stuff. And we're gonna see we're gonna see that when we get into combat, but for now let's just look at the last couple of things, which is uh, this is the arena. You, I haven't used the arena that much. I haven't needed to. We'll probably in a future episode take a look at that. Probably not in this episode. So, but but there's that as well. So you can. The thing is, in the arena, you're not fighting with your own team of monsters, you're drafting other teams. So, I guess the logic is, you know, you 
you you get your team together, you're comfortable with your build, you're destroying everything, but the arena forces you to just play with random monsters and just on the fly put together a team and try to make it a good team. And so you've got to figure out which things synergize with other with other things and uh, if you're playing with monsters that you don't often play with this is actually a decent way to get a sense of how they work but as i said i haven't done it too extensively so we're not going to be seeing it just yet but in a future episode we'll definitely be looking at some arena combat and let's go here to the left this dude is the person you talk to if you want to do some uh, team management on your current group. You can change their order, you can swap people in and out, you can uh, also manage their equipment so each creature can have spell gems equipped which allow them to cast spells. They can also have an artifact equipped and you can uh, so the menagerie is your creatures that you've summoned but which aren't currently in your party and you can if you want just add you know with the click of a button with a single command get back all the sm all the spell gems and all the artifacts you might have equipped on them so that's a handy little touch okay so that's all about that. There are other things, um, but before we get into them, I think let's just get into some quick combat and I'll talk about my build as well. So let's interact with this object and let's take a look at the screen. and. Basically, the way runs in this game work is that you have to decide which realm depth you're going to go into, which is a way of, uh, like, it's the difficulty, it's how strong the monsters are, and also the way to progress is by trying to clear the highest realm depth that is available to you. And once you do that, <coughs> excuse me, and once you do that, then the level after that will unlock and then you go one at a time and that's how you make progress. Now after you beat the main story at that point you will unlock well you'll unlock the first stage of the endgame. Uh, you beat the story at around I think realm depth like 60 or 70 very early on and then you unlock nether bosses so, nether bosses are basically bosses that you, five, uh, that you fight at each, like every five realms. So each realm that's a multiple of five, after you've beaten the main story, you'll be fighting a nether boss. And the nether bosses are basically the same bosses you fought during the story, but buffed. Now, if you kill all of the nether bosses, once like you do one round of killing every single one of them i think there are 30 of them in total if you do one round of killing them all that'll land you at realm the <coughs> excuse me at realm depth 240 you unlock the first stage of the end game the first major mechanic that is locked in the very beginning of the game. One of the reasons why I'm not starting at the beginning is this thing right here, which I've put surrounded. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I've got a. Recovering from a bit of a cold, I should have probably added that disclaimer earlier in this video, but uh, it's not. It's not too. It probably sounds a bit worse th than it is. But anyway. So this is the first major mechanic that is locked to you in the beginning of the game. This is the Gate of the Gods, and in it... Well, before we talk about the Gate of the Gods, let's talk about the individual gods. Now, each of these realms... And it goes into two pages, the number of possible realms. 
each of these realms has a god associated with them. If you want to see a handy list of all the gods, just go to your codex and uh, I guess you can click on blessings of the gods or I guess a better way is to go to currency and go to emblems. So each god will have an emblem associated with them and you see this list under the uh, under the word emblems, that's the list of gods. So Aeolian, Analtha, uh, Azurel, Alexandria, those are all the names of the various gods in the game. There are, I believe, 30 of them. 20 of them you get from the main story. 10 of them which you have to unlock by getting this guy to do projects for you. I've unlocked all of the uh, extra realms and all of the extra gods, so unless they add more of them, all of them should be available to us. But yes, once you beat all of the nether bosses once, you get access to the gate of the gods, where you can actually challenge the various gods that you meet in the game to combat. Now, even though I've had access to the Gate of the Gods for a while, I haven't used it much. You'll see there are a few where I've got one kill on them, but I've done, the, I've done those kills on low level, so you can decide which level you want to fight. And uh, there's a thing at the bottom where it says you have to beat all the gods at difficulty 10 or higher to ascend your specialization. I haven't done that. The only kills I've gotten is that occasionally, occasionally, the uh, you will be given a quest to kill a god, and uh, I've, and you know I'll do those quests for now at a low level just to get that quest reward, but I'm not going to be pushing for ascending my specialization just yet, and. Uh, I guess at this point I'll talk about quests, what kind of quest I'm talking about. So it's basically prophecies. So this is a way to give you a type of uh, currency in this game that's used to advance yourself. So you do various quests and you're rewarded with piety. What do you do with piety? Well, you go to this place and you spend it to buy or upgrade relics from the gods. Now each god, in addition to having their own realm, having their own special boss fight, and other things as well, they have their own creatures, as they have their own decorations, it's all a crazy amount of complicated stuff. They also have their own relic, which is a way to... Uh, further customize and further uh, flesh out your build. I only have two relics unlocked yet. I'm not going to talk about them yet because I am about to start talking about my build and I'll mention relics when... well I guess, I guess I'll stand next to this place and I'm going to... I might as well start talking about my build now and then we'll see which relics I have equipped and then at long last, we'll get going, we'll do some combat. So, before I talk about my build, let's talk about my class. I'm playing as an animator. This is not what the animator looks like by default. I've uh, equipped a special uh, costume. And if we look at my creatures as well, you'll notice a bit of a red, black, gray color scheme going on. Uh, that is definitely deliberate. I have curated it to look this way. So I'm playing as an animator and specifically this build is based on a build that I found on the internet. I'll be linking to it in the description. It's called uh, the Thrive on Death animator build. Now let's talk about what the animator does, how the animator works. Basically the animator is the only class that comes with its own special monster that no other class can use. This creature is called the Animus. 
the way the animus works is it gets huge buffs depending on what your party arrangement is like. And uh, if you read the description for the class specialization, it basically tells you that for the animator, its build will be built basically around the animus. Now, what is the animus? Let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it, at its creature sheet. Let's take a look at its traits. Brilliant creation. This creature has more attack and intelligence for each dead creature on your side, and more defense and speed for each living creature. And there's a second, a second trait that I've given it through its artifact, the overkill trait, which is after this creature attacks, the damage exceeds 35% of the target's maximum health. Actually, before I start talking about secondary traits, let me talk about how the Thrive on Death build works. So the Thrive on Death build is based on one of the, oops, based on one of the perks that you get through the animator class. So I'll run through the perks that I've selected. I haven't gotten all of them because some of them are either bad for my build or are not needed yet. So I've gotten this one, which gives my animus, animatus random, I've, have, <coughs> excuse me, have I been saying animus? Uh, but. If I have, the actual name is Animatus. Your Animatus starts battle with random buffs, just a great thing to have. Then there's this, uh, you gain an extra trait at the start of battle depending on who the creature is on slot 5. Additionally, Animated Weapon, just a good, unambiguously good thing. A dark anima I haven't selected because it casts random spells and sometimes that can be bad. Like I have, I, like I did have animated gem for a while but there was one battle where from a winning position it completely screwed me and I since then I'm like I'm never taking this ever again. For some builds it might work, for mine it's not necessary. Maybe it can speed up a battle that you were already winning, but it can also turn a battle which you were winning into a loss, which is why I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take it. Corpse explosion, very or like death and decay rather, which gives you corpse explosion, very important, and this is one of the ways that we blast through our enemies. It's a devastating spell, absolutely vital for this build. Desensitization, immune to debuffs in normal battles, resistant to debuffs in boss battles, pretty, yeah, you know, good, good thing to have. Endowment. At the start of battle, your animatus fuses with a copy of the second creature in your party. I actually have not used this because my animatus is the second creature in my party, so it would be fusing with itself. It's not doing anything. That also means that with my current party layout, I'm not getting the full benefit of the class perks. But there is a reason that I've set up my party this way. We'll talk about that shortly uh, after I have talked about the last couple of perks, which is uh, Forbidden Magic. The first time your animators is killed, it resurrects. Just beautiful, wonderful thing. Splits damage with your sixth creature. I currently have it splitting damage with the very tanky creature in uh, rank in slot six. Again, a good thing to have. Your animators gain spell slots. Again, wonderful. Although I don't think I'm using all of them. I think I have some empty spaces. Maybe we'll we'll see. Buffs and minions persist through death. Wonderful. Masterpiece, after your creatures gain a buff, your animators gains that buff as well. You can stack up a crazy amount of buffs on your animators this way. I love it. Molecular Betrayal, at the start of battle, your animators gains 
of your third creature's stats. My third creature in this case is uh, this ebony ant. So, you know, you can, I guess, customize what kind of stat bonus you're getting by messing around with the third creature's stats, and it isn't optimal. Like, I haven't really min-maxed that part of it that much, but, you know, I'm just getting some general stats. Let's think of it that way. Maybe we'll fine-tune uh, this thing later on by fixing around my third creature, and then finally thrive on death. I saved the most important for the last. This is what makes the build work. After your creatures are killed, your animators gains 50% of their stats. Now I mentioned that my build is called the, or the build that I've based this on, but I've kind of taken it into my own different direction. It's called the Thrive on Death build for a reason. That we are going to be deliberately killing our creatures to give stats to my animators. And specifically we're going to be killing the creature in rank 6 over and over again. Let's look at this creature and let's look at what traits it has and you'll understand why I've opted to go with the build this way. So trait number one immediately after this creature dies it has a 50% chance to resurrect with 100% health. Immediately you can see the synergy between this and gaining stats when a creature dies. Like it dies, it has a chance to come back, and then if it dies again you just get more health. However, there is a complication to this. And then there's trait 2, which is Woe. This is the trait that I've given to it via fusing it with a different uh, creature. This when it dies, it also damages creatures. Now, this is important because this is going to be one of the ways that we do damage to enemies. And I've helped this along by buffing this guy's health massively. You don't see the health on uh, this screen, like the number in the green bar is the health. But you're not seeing the full health that this guy has. The full health that he has, we'll see it when we get into uh, an actual realm. It's going to be much higher than this, and that's going to be one of the ways we do damage. But there's also trait number three. After this creature is resurrected, your other creatures are resurrected as well. What a... Like, what a... Like, what a trait combination. And I'll freely admit, this part of the build I didn't find by myself because like there are so many traits in this game like more than a thousand each monster has its own trait and I didn't even realize this trait existed but now that I see it I like what a just what a beautiful combination like it's a chef's kiss just lovely lovely this like each time this guy comes back, and he has a 50% chance to come back just regardless, your entire party gets resurrected. Just wonderful. So that's going to be the main part of our build, but there are other things helping us along. Chiefly, there's this creature, our creature in slot 1, her ability, Dark Dance, all effects that activate when a creature dies will activate one additional time. That includes the stat bonuses gained upon death. That also includes corpse explosions. So this is going to be very important to us. Uh, trait 2, not that important. Uh, trait 3, actually, we'll, we'll look at later. because. That's where we get into how my build is different from the one that I've linked to in the description. Now let's look at creature number two. Oh, sorry. Have I... Have I... Uh... Whoa, 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 what, what have I done? I unequipped your artifact by mistake. Okay. 
it's a creature number five rather this is the one that we're getting the bonus trait from based on our animators perk this is the unicorn vivifier let's look at its traits after this creature attacks it resurrects a random ally and I've gained that trait or I gained that trait at the beginning of combat so this is another way of uh, in case things get out of hand and in case this method of resurrecting our party isn't working we have an alternate method so that's good now trait 2 this is where my build starts getting a bit different from what uh, the linked build does so the linked build goes heavy into uh, buff debuff uh, synergies buffing your party debuffing the enemy but I've gone a slightly different route. I've got Final Breath. After an enemy is resurrected, it has a 75% chance to be killed again. Uh, mainly, I do this because there are a lot of battles where I think I've won, but then one enemy resurrects and then I've got to do a whole extra turn. It gets really annoying. This is a good way to end battles against trash mobs quickly. And then final buffs, disposability. Your other creature's buffs persist through death, just a, just a, a good thing, not a, I, I don't, yeah, you know, it's, it's good enough to keep, but the main thing are the first two things, the, the extra resurrection and shutting down enemy resurrections. Now we get into why my build is different from the one in uh, the uh, description. So the one in the description has animators in rank 1 and so you're getting full advantage of you know the fusion perk and so uh, yeah I do have a couple of empty spell slots we'll see what to put in them later and it does damage via star pact where this spell will damage enemies based on uh, how many buffs this creature has. So pretty obvious synergy and it's it's good. I could definitely push it to the limit if I went with the uh, same build in the description but I've gone slightly differently. The reason I have the animators in rank 2 and not in rank 1 is because creatures 1 and creatures 3 have a uh, A hang on, how do I view the artifact without hmm. Sorry, I'm struggling right now because I seem to have forgotten... Oh, oh, here we go. Oh, it's because I unequipped your artifact by accident. Okay. Okay. Here we go. If we go to our creatures, and if we go to view unequip artifact on the creatures in slot 1, and on the creature in slot 3, I have... If you look at just below the second tricks slot, it says Goad. That is a trait that they're getting through the artifact they have equipped. Now if you go to the creature sheet and if you look at their traits, if you look at what Goad does, your creatures adjacent to this creature attack two additional times. and. Both of these have Goad as their third trait, which they're getting as their artifact, which means if we add 2 plus 2, you get 4, but you also start with one attack by default. This means my animators will be attacking five times. Not only that, it also means my Centaur Duelist, the party member that I haven't talked about yet, or uh, like these two I haven't talked about yet, but this one is feeding into this kind of mini synergy that I just created because 
not only is he attacking five times, he's attacking three times. And in addition, I have this perk, uh, this trait. When your creatures attack an enemy multiple times, the damage is increased by 25% for each attack. So you can put out a huge amount of damage. As I'm sure you can already guess, it can get pretty crazy. And your second trait is Dark Embrace, which is after your creatures die, this creature gains 25% of their attack, defense and speed. So kind of a weaker version of what the Animatus is getting. So the way battles work is uh, if they last long enough, and if they go well, they don't always go well, but if they do, that means this creature and this creature will end up getting really buffed and they will be the ones that'll take down my enemy. Okay, last creature I haven't talked about yet is this guy. He has nature's blessing. Our creatures have mending and take less damage. Just a really good defensive thing to have. And trait two is bide. When this creature attacks, it deals damage equal to 100% of the damage it took since it last attacked. Uh, I'm not too happy with this. I'm probably gonna change this out for a different trait later on by fusing a different creature. But for now, it hasn't held me back too much. And trait three, of course, we just looked at. It was goad. So that's our build. The other thing that makes this build work is one of the relics, which I haven't talked about yet. Relics are just an extra item, I guess you can think of them, that you can equip to specific creatures and they give them crazy abilities. So what I have right now is Bloodseeker. I'm not gonna read all of these because I've ranked it up all the way to 100. And it, well, it boosts health, but it also at each rank gives you a special ability. The important ones are at rank 50 after the bearer gains maximum health. Your other creatures also gain health. And also the creature always has leeching, that's important. And also, the potency of the bearer's spells is based on 50% of maximum health rather than intelligence. That's important because your health is going to just reach crazy levels and if your damage is scaling even slightly based on your health, you do a crazy amount of damage. And then there are other, you know, maximum health synergies. So I've got that on my uh, Animatus and on my Centaur Duelist, who is kind of my, like, you can think of it like Animatus Jr. Like, he's getting half the buffs when creatures die. So he's also getting stronger, but not at the same level. On him, I've equipped, also ranked all the way up to 100, Vitreous, the Eye of Anelta. This one is basically, each time, like, it synergizes with the amount of times you've attacked. So the bearer deals 5% more damage based on how many times it's attacked. You also gain more attack for each time it and this relic has attacked. So it it's one of those things that synergizes with attacking a lot. So it makes sense to have it on the second creature in my party that has multiple attacks. So, I think we've been talking for such a long time, but there has been so much important stuff to talk about. But now that I've talked about my build, I think it's time to just go in, go for some combat. But before, before we get into combat, I need to start a girl, uh, sorry, I need to, I need to start a project. This is the game mechanic that I mentioned that was unlocked after I beat Realm Death 415. Which is guilds. The final layer of your, uh, well, the layer of difficulty in terms of new endgame bosses, and also a layer of complication slash uh, customization on your build is unlocked through these guilds. And I'm gonna start out by getting the life guild. Alright, now with all of that done. Let's get into combat. Let's go into a random realm. Now I'm gonna be playing on Realm Instability 5. I'll talk briefly about instability. It's just a way to make the, make the game harder by giving the enemies uh, 
giving the enemies and the realm itself more dangerous pro uh, properties. And each time you do more properties appear on the right, and also the item bonus, based on what those properties are, will uh, vary. Now you can randomize it, and what I like to do is, I like to randomize it until I get a really nice item bonus. Uh, see, now this is great. 376 is really high. But sometimes you get, uh, you know, into situations that are a bit <laughs> too difficult. But you know what? Let's see how well we do. We can see these uh, six properties. And then there are five more that are hidden. But in exchange for that, we're going to have a really high item bonus. Let's see how this goes. Let's go into a random realm. Just jump straight in. So we are... Okay, this is actually really bad. So we are backed into a corner. There is a nemesis creature, which are kind of like champion creatures with extra uh, modifiers. Before we fight them... Now that we're in the realm, we can see the full list uh, that enemies, uh, you know, the full list of modifiers on this realm. So we saw the first six. In addition, enemies also have microbots as a minion. They lose less stats if you try to debuff them that way. That's not really a part of our build yet, but it will be in the future. But for now, that's just a... That's just an extra, th an extra thing for them. They also cast additional times, which can be deadly, but often the enemy just casts useless spells. In fact, most of the time, I find, so that's not really something I worry about too much. They also have good luck, which is really annoying, and they are fused with arbiters. All right. Ooh, he's walking the other direction. Can we... Oh, no, he's walking back in our direction. No. Can we convince him to... Okay, no, he's found us. He's found us. We have no choice but to fight these creatures. They are agile, which means they will all start at the top of the timeline, which means all six of these guys are going to move before we get a single turn. And often that results in just a party wipe. Yeah, see, look at this guy. One of the rare instances where actually cast a spell that was useful. Just wiped everyone out, except for our animators and our Dread White. But we have a few tricks up our sleeve. If we get a chance to move, Flood of Darkness, one of those spells that didn't do anything. Death's Call, not really doing anything. Ooh, that was bad, whatever happened. But somehow the animators is still alive. Abundance is annoying, but uh, I think we might be able to deal with it. Assuming this spell casting session ever ends. So our animators attacked. I'm actually not sure why he attacked. Because this was just a free attack that he took. It's either because of one of the buffs he has right now. Let's look at his buffs, actually. Creatures with splashing, that, no. Agile is a chance to dodge. Berserk creatures deal more, I don't know, maybe it's Berserk? That maybe it just gives you a chance to attack randomly? I don't know. Anyway, now we've finally got a chance to move, and now that our creatures are dead and we were finally able to collect the buffs from the creatures dying, our animatus is pretty, pretty buffed. And because he landed a hit on the enemy, we brought one of our creatures back. But that's a largely moot point, because what we're going to do is... We're going to cast a spell. Now, the spell we're going to cast is Reincarnation on our dread white what that does is it'll kill it and then bring it back to life and you might be wondering what's that sounds like a pointless spell in and of itself yes that would be a pointless thing to do but with 
our build, I think you can see where this is going. So... I'm gonna cast it, but not through this. I've actually, because I'm gonna be doing this specific action so often, I've actually set up a macro for this creature, which has these lines in it. It's that if creature 6 is alive, cast reincarnation on that. And there are other lines in it, which is if it's dead, defend. And if you have silenced or blind, defend. Uh, we'll talk more about why those parts are in the macro. When slash if we get blinded or silenced. But for now, let me just click on this. And it ki killed it, brought it back to life. It killed the creature that we damaged. And then killed the rest of them. And then corpse explosions killed the rest of them. It also killed us because... Uh, of the reflection, the damage reflection. And then we got a whole bunch of loot. A whole bunch of loot. Now finally we get to talk to our god. Now each realm will have a god altar. The first thing you want to do each time you enter a realm is donate. There are achievements for donating X number of times, but mainly you want to get your favor with the gods up. On the bottom right, you can see my favor rank. Each time it levels up, you gain a new favor rank, and then you need more favor to reach the next rank. And reaching ranks gives you all kinds of special abilities. In fact, let's talk to Gonfurion. Let's see what blessings he's giving us right now. This is a, a huge list. Some of them will give you buffs within this specific realm, or like debuffing the enemies based on the objects you interact with. Some of them are just all around good applying everywhere like dumpling spawn chance less chance for you know treasure golem spawn chance less chance for dumplings to flee we'll talk about dumplings later again as with every other thing in this game dumplings are their own separate can of worms their own separate complicated little system but anyway this is important this has given us uh, our first buff. Now this buff is gonna last for the rest of this realm. All our creatures have leeching, ah, that's not that important because it really only matters for our animators. But by the way, when I open a chest, all the loot will appear briefly to the left. The reason is because I have the game set to a strict loot filter. So usually anytime, like when you start the game, if you haven't changed anything, anytime you get any sort of loot, it'll pop up on the middle of the screen and then you'll have to dismiss it. I've set it so that it'll only do that for the rarest kind of loot. But how are we gonna do this? Should I, should I attack or should I cast? Um, reincarnation. Because the problem is, as soon as our animators move, four of them are going to move. And if they kill my Rift Dancer and my Vivifier, potentially we'll have to wait until the last two, like the at the end and the duelist before we get any sort of turn. You know what? I'm gonna... I'm gonna cast... I'm gonna use my macro. I'm gonna reincarnate the Dread White. Okay, this is unfortunate. We came close to killing two of them, but not enough. That's because they ha... Yeah, see? Killed my... Uh... Tried to kill my Vivifier, but didn't. Successfully did kill my Rift Dancer. So they have 242% extra health. If it wasn't for that, they would have been wiped out because those two would have died and then corpse explosions would have killed the rest. But because they thankfully didn't kill my uh, Vivifier, by the way, my Vivifier 
cast Archangel's Blessing, that is due to the spell slot on its artifact, which gives it a chance to cast a spell when its turn comes up. And what Archangel's Blessing does is it heals all of your uh, party members a percentage of health, which is very important when your max health becomes very high, and also gives uh, random buffs. And each, buffs, each buff we get also gets passed along to our animators. And so we're gonna do that. Oh, I shouldn't have used the macro. I'll explain why in the next battle where either our Rift Dancer or our uh, Unicorn Vivifier gets a chance to move, but I should have cast that spell differently. Made a bit of a mistake there. Okay, there's another Nemesis creature. Let's grab this, uh, let's grab this chest. Grab this, uh... Grab that. Let's fight these guys. No big deal. Paragons are really, really annoying. What is this one doing? Oh, your creatures deal more damage. This one is fine. There's another type of paragon where it makes its creatures take less damage. That's the annoying one because then sometimes they get way too defensive. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to... Attack this guy at the back. Oh, ooh. Dealt 2.1 million damage. And even though damage reflection killed off my uh, animators, we. Ah, see, this guy barely survived once again. Once again, they're. Uh... What, what did. Hang on, what did I do? What did I do? I think I accidentally used my macro instead of uh, what I intended to do, which was to cast Resurrection on the uh, dead Dread White. And now that our Vivifier gets a chance to go, I'll explain the mistake I made the first time. The mistake I made was I used the macro when I should have manually cast the spell this way. So what the macro does is it will by default cast the spell from your main spell slots rather than from your ethereal spell slots. You get ethereal spell slots from spells being generous. So you can customize each spell slot with different enchantments and what the generous property does is it gives an ethereal version of that to other creatures. The ethereal version only has one charge but it refreshes every battle, whereas the main ones have fi like usually more than one charge, but are they don't refresh for the entire realm. And what I did is I just wasted two of those charges when I could have handled it with a regular charge. You might be thinking, well, what's the point if it's if the spell is getting cast? And if you're always going to have uh, ethereal charges, why worry about that distinction? No, there are instances in the game where it really, really matters whether you're able to cast a spell via ethereal or via regular spell. And if you can help it, try not to waste your regular spell gems if you have ethereal ones that will work. And now I'm going to interact with this object. This is going to throw us into more combat. And once again, find ourselves in a bit of a pickle. But what I'm going to do is I am going to use my macro because I don't think one of them is going to kill my Rift Dancer. So only one of them is going to take a turn before our Rift Dancer will get a chance to go. I'll use my macro. Once again, frustratingly, Okay. This is this is bad. What else could I have done? I mean, we won in the end, but uh 
I don't know if I could have done it in a way where uh, we killed them sooner than that. Maybe if I had attacked them, could have gone differently. Now that we've gained a, a temporary 10% attack, maybe that is a... Except... Except against these guys, our creatures are dealing less damage. Okay. Okay, this is a... This is gonna be rough. This is gonna be very, very rough. So attacking is a... Uh, not really an option against these guys. Let's use our macro again. Okay, I think we might be fine. Because corpse explosions should finish them. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Grab some loot. Ooh, this is debuffed enemies. And we also get more speed. Those bookshelves. We get more intelligence from that. We get rebirth for all our creatures and more health. That's just fantastic. Let's pick up some of these materials. Uh, these ones are materials we need <clears throat> for the project we're doing. Let's get that. More intelligence. No, proficient. More attacks. Building up our, uh, our party. More intelligence. And let's fight more of these creatures. This time, I think, let's let's attack. I... Okay, once again, damage reflection wiped us out. But, because of the ability on my artifact, um... The overkill ability, this means if I do enough damage to one creature, all creatures will take that damage. So that's an excellent way to clear out collections of trash mobs. In fact, I'm gonna attempt to do that again. Once again, I think this is gonna kill us, yes. But once again, the Turn one advantage was all we needed to win that fight. Okay. Okay, this time our Rift Dancer goes first, so let's do it this way. Let's cast the Ethereal Reincarnation, preserving our uh, Spell Gem version. Let's cast it on our... Um... Red white, and this time we killed everyone, and nobody even died once. That went well. well. Let's collect this emblem. Emblems are currencies that you need to buy things from gods. All like never leave emblems just lying on the ground. They're good to have. Ooh, here's a riddle dwarf. What class does the Pillways Guardian belong to? Now, riddle dwarves are—they'll just ask you a random question about some spell or some creature. And you have to give an answer, and I will cheat every single time this happens because I am not memorizing thousands, well, like tens of thousands of combinations of things if you count spells and creatures. Um, so, so Pillwiz Guardian is nature. I just looked it up on. Uh, my computer. I have absolutely no shame about cheating for those. I, I like. I, I don't think anybody playing this game is legitimately trying to remember all the r riddle answers. I mean, come on. Let's let's just let's just call it like it is. All right, we're getting more loot. And our last wandering enemy. This is going to be tough, but I think we should start by attacking the, this person. Ooh, okay, yeah. We didn't have the attack advantage. So, previously when I was attacking enemies, it highlighted them in red when we attacked them. 
which meant we were doing more damage, but that also meant we were reflecting more damage back on ourselves. So even though we didn't kill them, these like sl these smaller amounts of damage we were dealing helped us stay alive. <coughs> Excuse me. So in a way, it did help. Now this creature has a really annoying ability, is that most of the damage he takes is deferred until it takes its turn. So usually, like trying to kill it is a... Wow, our centaur duelist managed to kill it. Doing just enough damage thanks to the uh, ability from Vitreus. But usually I just end up skipping my turn because I know I will have done enough damage to it to kill it. I just need for it to have its turn so that it can finally die. Okay, anyway. Now we don't have any enemies left. We can see it says enemies 0 plus master. That means there is. One master to be fought in this realm. The master is right here. And there are no wandering enemies, but there will be other uh, bits of combat. Chiefly, uh, will we interact with this final object of this type? Okay, once again, I'm not going to waste any more of your charges. I'm going to use reincarnation manually. Ooh! The health bonus we got means he's doing more damage when he dies, which meant we were able to kill them in one round of casting that spell, as opposed to them having an annoying tiny sliver of health left. Now, our, our realm quest for this realm is interesting. We have to slay knights. Knights are going to be these guys wandering around. You have to interact with them to get into combat with them. Here's how I'm gonna do this. First, I'm gonna fight this knight. We should go first. Once again, I'm going to... Uh, I'm gonna try and attack this guy. Again, we have the attack bonus, which means we kill them. It also means the reflect damage kills the two of us. It kills my animators, but it also kills my dread white because he's splitting damage with my animators and you know that doesn't make a difference if you're taking millions of damage back but notice the text that popped up briefly for one battle our enemies are going to have fewer spell gems so while we have that buff instead of fighting other knights who we know we can beat pretty easily i'm gonna fight the master in this case it is the gargoyle master who, as he mentioned, is great at casting nature spells. Honestly? Let's just, uh, do our, uh, the same thing we did against the knights. And that's just a, that's just an instant wipeout. Trust me, most combats against masters will be a lot more difficult than that, and we also get more mastery. Now mastery is another aspect of the end game which I haven't talked about yet. The way mastery works is that each time you fight a master you get certain bonuses. Well the first time you fight the master you get uh, you get a special uh, trait material and each master uh, has its own one. You can read them. I'm not going to go through all of them right now. But there's one for each type of race in this game. Some of them are very difficult to find because they're special ones like the Elemental. The Mimic Master is another one that I will have only beat once. And the Dumpling Master is the third one that is difficult to find. I've beaten them three times. Interesting. And then I think there's a fourth special master that I haven't even found yet. But you can see I've beaten them various amounts of times because I've just been going to realms. I've been going to random realms, and so some of them I'll have found more than others. So anyway, that's how it works with masters. Oh, and you not only get the trade material, 
But as you can read, based on the number of times you've beaten them, you get these extra bonuses, which is uh, more damage dealt, more less damage taken, and so on. Right, now that we've beaten the Master, the only thing left to do is to... Finish the realm. Cleared everything else? Well, hang on. There's a... Bit we haven't explored. And you should always explore, because often in these dead ends you'll find chests. And chests with this high item bonus will give you a large amount of stuff. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fight one more knight and then I'll make a slight change before fighting the third one. Okay. Same deal. We die because of the damage reflection, but they die because they never stood a chance. And, oh, but I haven't mentioned this, but this is also one of the things that Gonfurion likes. Each realm will have things like this, where you can either interact with objects or fight certain creatures, get into certain combats to get favor with that god. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, go to gameplay, and for one battle only, I'm going to change my loot filter to none so that we see every single thing we get just this one time so i can go through all the kinds of loot Ooh, one of them is going first and attacked the wrong <laughs> creature so oh 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 for some reason this guy was much tankier Ah, uh, okay. This creature intercepts attacks on its allies and takes less damage. So it's not even... We couldn't even have attacked anyone else. So it's not like I made a mistake by attacking it. So... Somehow they managed to survive our first turn. But... I mean... We were never gonna lose... We were never gonna lose. And now we've won? Well, first of all, we get a bit of favor with Confurion. Next, we've completed the realm quest, and now we get treasure. Now, take a look at what we found. We've gotten... This is the list of things that we've gotten, and it's really long because I've... For this battle only, allowed the game to pop up every single thing we've gotten. We've gotten Piety. This is uh, the thing we use to upgrade our relics, you know, like the uh, like Vitreous and Blood Seeker, and we can get other relics for our other creatures later on. So we've gotten a good amount of Piety. Pale Amber, this is a material that you can use to upgrade your artifacts with stat bonuses. There are other types of Amber, like, you know, yellow and green, and they will either boost single stats or uh, stat combinations, so we've gotten some of these. Brimstone is just one of the main types of currency in this game, as is Crystal and Essence. Power is the other type of currency. Tomes are things that you can do to change your creature's base stat progression. So for instance, this one will make them faster at the cost of health. And there are reasons to have different ones on different creatures. This is a scroll giving us knowledge points. Knowledge, uh, like I'll talk about that briefly when we uh, look at our bestiary, our bestiary. We have more amber. Sparkling arcane dust. This is a type of currency that you can only get from doing realms, from completing realm quests. And it's gonna help you complete projects. Curios are, again, things that you can slot into your artifacts. They give them, uh, uh, you know, other uh, interesting uh, abilities. More amber. Citrine is a thing. It's one of the many, like, similar to upgrading artifacts with the other properties. 
these types of gems can be used to upgrade your spell gems and give them different types of properties. Like this one has this specific properties, but there's all kinds of others. More uh, knowledge uh, points for creatures in our bestiary. Granite, another type of resource. More knowledge. A curio. This is another thing that you can put into your artifacts. More amber. This is a trait material. Rarer than uh, the other things we've seen so far. And this one... Um, I I'm pretty sure you can only find trait materials that are... Or usually you'll find trait materials that are n native to the creatures in the realm that you're fighting. I think. This one, I don't know. It feels like... Like Neural Chip feels like a, a forgotten lab kind of uh, trait material. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there is a creature in this zone that has that trait. And then finally, we get an emblem because we were in Gonfurion's realm. We completed Gonfurion's quest. And as an extra bonus, he's given us uh, one of his emblems. Okay. And ooh, because we completed our mission, we can hand in one of our projects. That's good. What I'm going to do, though, immediately I'm going to change my loot filter back to... Oh, 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 uh, what? Gameplay. Back to strict. There we go. And now that we're done, I am going to head on... Ooh, there's a... Oh, well, there, there could have been a chest there, but there wasn't. Gonna head on home. I'm gonna turn in this project and we are going to end this video because it's been going on for more than an hour. Okay, let's hand in this project. We completed an assassination mission. That's a way to get trait materials for creatures that you have S rank with. I guess before we end the video, I'll talk quickly about creature knowledge and uh, the bestiary. The bestiary. So no, first of all, the game wasn't lying when they said more than 1,200 creatures. They have 1,201, which is the smallest number that you can have while still being technically accurate when you claim more than 1,200. So that's a that's I, just something I find funny. But anyway, for each creature, you'll notice there's a level next to them. That's my level of... Let's go by... let's go by sort by knowledge. That's the level of knowledge I have of them. So we're uh, going in ascending order of knowledge. Starting with these guys who are at the very lowest. Then you have these guys in D rank. Then we go to our C rank. Then B. Then A. And then S. So if you go to Creature Knowledge, it'll show you what Knowledge Rank means. And generally, you want to get more knowledge about all your creatures, but you don't need to grind knowledge. It's just something that you'll be getting passively while you play, and each Knowledge Rank gives you more, uh, more stuff. More experience and resources, that's a great one at Rank B. Rank C is an important one. You can summon it at the Divination Candle. Rank A, you have a better chance of finding the card, and rank S means you can then assassinate it to get uh, its trait material. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to start another project. Let's just get all the guilds done, and then we can start doing other projects afterwards. And I think it's time to bring this video to a close. There is so much more to talk about. But I think we've covered enough of the basics. Like, even the basics in this game feel complicated, but trust me, what we've been talking about in this episode so far has been surface level stuff. And if that seems crazy to you, then you're not wrong. This is a crazy, crazy game in terms of the amount of depth that it has. But the rest of that is going to have to wait for subsequent videos because it is time 
to bring things to an end, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed our first little foray into this absolute beast of a game. And uh, I look forward to seeing you for the next one as well. And uh, until then, take care.